Thank you very much, Jen. Hello, Austin. Hello, TEDx. As a child, I was fascinated by kaleidoscopes. I loved looking through the kaleidoscopes and seeing how the pieces would shift. And you know, sometimes as I would play with the kaleidoscope, I would turn and turn the kaleidoscope and the pieces would barely shift. But sometimes I would nudge the kaleidoscope and suddenly all the pieces would come and come together in an entirely new pattern. And no matter how much I shook and changed, moved the kaleidoscope, I could never get them back into the original pattern. Right now in the world, we're experiencing some dynamic changes. And just like the kaleidoscope pieces, we can't, no matter what we do, we can't get them back into the original pattern. And there is no place in the United States that is changing as fast and as dramatically and on such a grand scale as the state of Texas. And for those of you who want to shape the future, change the world, it's important to understand the trends that are happening right here in Texas. And I love, I love explaining trends and what's happening. And I especially love talking about the demographic changes here in Texas. And it's actually very timely because the census data is just coming out. And what we're seeing is some of these trends are colliding, what I call kaleidoscope shifts, in entirely new and different ways. Now, I'm also an engineer, so I've got to show you some data. <laughs> so we're just going to show three slides to help you understand and kind of frame the information. And again, we're using data up to 2008, just because the census data from 2010 is just coming out right now. But you'll see that it's definitely reflected in the information you'll be seeing. So first of all, on your left, you'll see the circle on your left. I call it the donut. And I want you to sort of orient yourself. The yellow on this slide stands for the yellow rose of Texas. I went to Stanford, so the red is Cardinal Red, California. And then the teal, Miami, Florida. The green represents the 47 states, the other 47 states of the country. So if you look at the donut on your left, what you're going to see is those three states, Texas, California, and Florida, make up one quarter of the US population. And the other 47 states make up the other three quarters. Now the second circle on the right, that represents the increase in the number of children from the year 2000 to 2008. And that period was a period of dramatic change, especially for Texas. So if you look at that, that donut on the right, you suddenly see that those three states that made up a quarter of the US general population actually make up more than half of the increase of the children. And Texas, which only makes up about 8% of the general US population, makes up a quarter of all the increase. If you think about it being the yellow rose, there's a lot of yellow roses in bloom in Texas right now. <laughs> but it's remarkable because the growth of the US, it's really of children, is in those three states. Those of you who are analytic, the real numbers are in 2000, we had 19 million children under five. In 20, 2008, we had 20.4, difference of a little bit over 1.4 million. And yes, that means almost 400,000, the increase, was right here in this state. Now, you may be thinking, hey, Sylvia, you're just kind of focusing on children. How about other aspects of growth in the US? OK, now this chart. What it does is shows you, if you look at the red, that's the general increase. That's the change in the US population from 2000 to 2008. And what you can see is the red is the general population. Yellow is the tip of the baby boom and their parents. And the green is the increase of the children under the age of five. Now, if you look at the far right, that's the 47 states. What you see is the general growth rate, a little bit over 5%. The next fastest growing group, tip of the baby boom and their parents. And then green in the 47 states, actually the growth of children actually lagged behind. Now let's look at our friends in Florida. Well, they've continued to grow, dramatic growth. And I think like you, maybe many of you might be thinking, hey, maybe it's just all retirement capital. And you would see, yeah, there is a good growth 
in the retirement age. But those seniors aren't having kids. And so there's also a huge growth rate in Florida of children, which is atypical of their history. Now let's look at our friends in California. Now California, the largest state in the nation, right, 36, with 36 million people, it's still growing faster than the U.S. population. And that kind of comes as a surprise to us in Texas because we think they're all moving here, right? <laughs> what you see is they're growing faster, but look at the group that's growing the fastest in California. That's the people over 65. And think about what happens to people over 65. They begin to retire and exit the workforce. Now let's look at the other group that's growing rapidly also in California, which is children under five. So California's got a bit of a challenge in the two fastest, some of the two fastest growing groups are the people exiting the workforce and the people starting to require services as well. So you know that California's got a little bit of a budget issue. But as I mentioned, no state is growing faster and more dramatically and on a grand scale than Texas. Look at that, more than double the national average in general growth and also people over 65 coming to the state and dramatic increase in the number of children under five. Now for most of you, this is like, wow, I can't believe this. It's not something that I see. And that's because probably you, like me, live in a neighborhood that looks a lot like the 47 states. So we're not maybe aware of all of this that's happening. But that, just because we're not aware doesn't mean we're not interconnected. And to show you that in another way, the last slide. Let me explain this slide just a little bit. First, the bottom axis, X, is age of children in the state of Texas. So age zero, six-year-old, nine-year-old, 11-year-old, all the way to age 19. And then the y-axis, the vertical axis, how many there are. Now the yellow band, it's as if the state demographer took a picture of how many children were in the state of Texas in the year 2000. And so if you're thinking about it and you're looking at that, you could say, hmm, pretty much it's around two, 320,000 people or children under the age of 19. So let's say you work for the DMV and you're thinking, all right, how many 15-year-olds, and, and it's the year 2000, you'd say, how many 15-year-olds next year are going to be getting their driver's license? You could pretty much say around 320,000 because you could see that this is historically an accurate trend. Some years, some growth, some years a little lower growth, but more or less the state grew kind of around the same amount. Now the green bar is 2008. The state demographer took a snapshot of how many kids. Now at that point, now you're the... You're looking out at those ages, and you see that before children born before the year 2000, the growth rate was commensurate with the state growth. The state grew about 10%, and so you'd say, huh, 320,000, that's another 30,000. It's around 350,000. And if you're looking for children born before the year 2000, you'd be absolutely right. Look at that green bar for kids 8 to 19. That's around 320,000. But look at for kids born in Texas after the year 2000. Yo, huge, right? Remember those yellow roses in bloom? That's that bubble right there. Now what's unique, there's no other state in the United States that is experiencing this kind of growth. No one but us. Now in fact, if we were to show you this chart for New York, the yellow bar would be greater than the green bar. They're actually having a decrease in children. Now. Just think for a moment. I just want you to be with me and think about children age two to four. Now think about some adjectives you would use to describe a two to three or four year old. Cute, sleek, cute, precocious, terrible twos, needy, <laughs> you know, full of potential, full of life. Now I want you to think about some adjectives for 14-year-olds or 15-year-olds or 16-year-olds. You might be thinking out of control, independent, headstrong, teen pregnancy, gang. And think about our state right now where we are right there. And think about the challenges we face. Now imagine that bubble that's coming through amplified with those very adjectives that you're thinking about. Now, I happen to have been a baby boomer here in the United States, 
And what that means is we had a bubble like this when we were baby boomers, but it was as though every state was experiencing it. What's unique now is that we're one of the few states that is experiencing it, and we're the only state that is experiencing it at this level and at this magnitude. So this is, could be a tsunami, or it could be a wave of opportunity. And so what I'd like to do is to help you think about how could this be a wave of opportunity, just like it was for the baby boomers, where, where by doing things and educating great institutions, great roads for that population, it heralded an unprecedented age of prosperity. We have the opportunity for that with us, and I'm offering you a couple of ways to think about that. So this is not a tsunami, but instead, it's actually a powerful wave to give us continued prosperity. Now, what I want to talk about is the global marketplace. Now, if you think about the global economy, really the language of the global economy, it's English. You're doing business around the world, it's English. But what we do know around the world, that sales and service it's always done in the local language. So, you know, I've got friends at Google, at Cisco, PayPal, Yahoo, and you know what they tell me? You know, Sylvia, we don't look at geographic boundaries. That's not the only way we look at information and content anymore. We really look at, we really look at how information is downloaded. And increasingly, that information is downloaded in clusters that have to do with language and culture. And think about it for yourself. How many of you are learning another language, thinking to be a little bit more globally competitive, or making sure that your child learns another language so that they can be globally competitive? Because in a global marketplace, yes, the language of business is English, but the language of service and sales, that's always done in the local language. So in the 21st century, Language and culture, that's the software of the 21st century. Language and culture, that's the software of the 21st century. So if you want to have a competitive edge for yourself, for your children, for your business, having another language will give you that competitive advantage because you'll be able to do service and sales in a global marketplace. That brings us to the second area, and that's teens. Teens around the world drive consumption. So what's the largest teen market in the world? You might be thinking China, right? Or India. If you're thinking India, you would be right. India has more than 400 million people under the age of 19. The second largest teen market, yes, that would be China, with 225 million. But did you know there's another market that, that is as big as the Chinese market that we're, that's right here? No, that's not just the U.S. We're a little bit under 90 million. And even if we bring in our friends from Canada, our teens from Canada, we don't even crack 100 million. But actually, it's the Americas. The Americas, and if you look at the Spanish and English-speaking teens in the Americas, that market, that's as big as the Chinese market. And if you add our friends from Brazil, 80 million strong, gets us to a teen market of over 300 million right here in the Americas. But if we just think about the Spanish speaking and English speaking, we here in Texas have a huge competitive advantage. That wave of kids coming through, they're already predisposed to be bilingual, bicultural. So right here, we could have the advantage of having accessing two markets with one workforce. Think about that competitive advantage. And those teens, how do you reach them? with what you have in your pocket, just like what I have in my pocket, over and over with mobile technology. And even though there may be, obviously, language and cultural differences, within the Americas there are a lot of language and cultural similarities, as well as brand similarities. So that is another way of thinking about this in terms of giving us a competitive advantage, but it requires that kaleidoscope shift of thinking a little bit differently. Now, we do know that the world is a, not a static place. It's a very dynamic place. And no place is changing as fast and as rapidly and as grand as the state of Texas. And I know some of you are thinking, well, now what do I do? And what I'd like to do is, first of all, just give you an illustration of a story. 
of a cyclist. You might have heard of him, Lance Armstrong. And when he's asked, how does he manage to go down mountains so fast and not crash? He says, I focus on where I want to go, not where I don't want to go. And cyclists call that choosing your line. And you've seen brilliant examples of that earlier today in everyone's conversations. Robin's Passion, Sonny, Gilbert's. They've chosen their line of how they're going to change the future. And so the first thing I'd ask you to do is get informed. And you've partly been informed with this kind of information, but get informed. And then choose your line. How are you going to be proactive and not reactive? Because I can tell you that we do not all share a past, but we all share a future. And the winners are going to be those that change, choose their line to shape the future. Thank you.